Hey there, welcome back to Squirrel North's ongoing series about modern management. Now today we have a bit of a challenge. We're going to be talking about six common management practices that we think you should stop doing. If you're doing any one of these, consider them best left in the 20th century. And we're going to talk to you about replacing them with alternate practices, ones that are a little bit more modern and take into account some challenges with the old practices. So let's get started. All right, the first management practice. This is called manage the work, not the workers. So this is a bit of a challenge because we've been led to believe for many, many years that individual productivity somehow equates to business performance. Business outcomes, as long as we work hard and everyone is working hard, somehow that is going to come together and mean that the organization is going to be doing well, our department is going to be doing well, and so on. And uh, uh, there actually hasn't been a lot of evidence to suggest that this is actually true. In fact, in many cases, this is actually something that gets in your way. You can maybe think of it as maybe a rock band or, or any kind of pop band where is that band effective based on the fact that everyone is on their instruments banging away at maximum rate all the time? Not really. It's really how it all comes together. And there are different songs that different people will take a more leading role on and others will take a more supporting role. But the idea here is that it's not about the individual productivity, but the focus on the overall outcome. How does it all come together? And this is kind of, you, you can see this in a lot of management practices where people get uncomfortable when maybe, you know, they don't see people banging away at keyboards and, and maybe if their job is to produce code, you know, are they not doing that? Or if they're in sales, are they, how are they not on the phone um, chasing the next lead? And so on and so on. You can come up with all sorts of examples. And so you might see this in meetings where we start to think of how we structure them. And a lot of meetings are set up where you might do a round table and everyone's talking about what they've been doing and what, what, what they're going to be working on next. Emails where you're checking on things. Metrics that you might be capturing around individual productivity. So a lot of this is kind of this steady focus on trying to really maximize the utilization of people with the goal of thinking that this is somehow going to help with business outcomes. Okay, so that's the challenge. What are we going to do about it? What do we suggest we do? So this is where manage the work, not the workers really comes in. You got to start by understanding your business a little bit better, uh, understand who your customers are, and what is it that you're doing for them, right? What are the things that they're waiting for? What are the things that are like, where is this thing? And so this focus needs to be front and center before all these other things, right? So you can still check in on people and do your round tables. But before we get to that, let's talk about what is it that we promised to the market? What are we thinking about delivering? And are they stuck? Are, you know, are, are things moving? Are we capturing the right metrics? Are we looking at things from the perspective of how things are flowing? And are we communicating as a result of inspecting that? Are things blocked? Are things uh, not progressing? And so this kind of changes the viewpoint of the manager or the leader as not someone who is necessarily leading people, but really about setting an environment, finding out what's actually blocking the delivery of work to our customers. And a lot of this is in handoffs, right? We're, um, maybe it's within the teams, maybe it's between departments. And so you're focusing on where is this work being held up? How can I create the environment so that things will not be held up? And focusing away from this idea of high utilization because that's not really the point, right? So your customers are not gonna be coming to you because, hey, we were all busy or you know, boy, did we work hard. And so that's the company I'm choosing to do business with or buy my product and so on. It's really about, you know, can they meet my needs? And so this focus on what are we exist here for 
and are we meeting our needs and what's getting in the way needs to become front and center about how we conduct ourselves and how we interact with our teams. So we're managing the work, making sure that it's flowing and getting to our, the hands of our customers. We're not really over obsessing over the workers and managing that from the perspective of keeping them um, highly utilized, uh, constantly productive from that perspective. All right, so that's the first one. All right, next one. All right, so this one is something I call don't kill the mutants. And, uh, you know, it's beyond the, you know, the funny title. It's really about this concept of everyone fitting in. So this is a good thing, obviously. You know, you want everyone to uh, work well together. You want some amount of harmony in your teams, your organization, your department. Uh, you're expecting everyone to collaborate and, and work well together. Now, that is good, um, but at the same time, you don't want to do it in a way that removes diversity. The idea here is that you want people to be different because you're, those differences are going to provide you with a variety of perspectives. And those perspectives could be seen as a huge competitive advantage. And so if you are an organization that values things like innovation, well, if we're all thinking the same way and we're all focusing highly on harmony and collaboration above all else, then you may not get that diversity that you're looking for, the things that are maybe introducing all sorts of improvements. And, you know, you can think about, you know, lots of classic stories around mutations where, you know, the first thing to do is, you know, get rid of it, whether it's the Frankenstein story or Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you know, we're kind of looking for the elimination maybe of diversity, finding things that don't quite fit. And so this could be of a bit of a counterintuitive challenge for us to say, well, you know what, we should maybe have some tolerance for diverse views. So what are we going to do about it? Your job as a leader is really to make it safe. Make it safe for a variety of different ideas and opinions to be expressed. It doesn't mean that you have to necessarily adopt all of them, uh, but make it at least possible that they can uh, come to the surface and maybe start to adopt some way of experimenting with new ideas so you can actually try some of these things. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's about tolerating jerks or, you know, dealing with poor behavior. It's really about tolerating a variety of perspectives. And some, if someone disagrees, you want to thank them. You want to bring that disagreement to surface so you can actually inspect it, understand it, and maybe even change your, your decisions as a result of them. So diversity, huge competitive advantage. Don't kill the mutants. The mutants may come in with some big change that may actually make your organization much more competitive. All right, let's get back into our third management practice. And I call this no improvement revolutions. All right, so you've got some great idea um, on how your organization, your business, your department could be better. Maybe you've been inspired. Uh, maybe it's something you've been thinking about for a while and there's some things that you know you don't quite like about how things are going. And you want to make a change. You want to make a big shakeup. Perhaps you've just been newly hired as a leader of an organization. The challenge here is that the evidence hasn't shown that big, fast changes stick. They tend to have a lot of failure uh, and the biggest form of that failure is, is usually regression to old ways. There are other versions, but all of this kind of leads to a lot of market risk. You're going to be going through this big shakeup. You're not going to be at, at the top of your game with regards to how your customers experience you. A and then if you can't make the change stick, then did you really go through all this pain for nothing? So you need to understand that you found yourself at this point in time in your organization, based on years of habits, practices, you've evolved to this way of working. And so in thinking about the fact that you've evolved to this way of working, the change has to take on that same viewpoint where we're gonna to evolve to a different way of working. And so if you're trying to make a big change overnight, you may be uh, ignoring a lot of implications on how do you actually get there? Do you have the know-how? Maybe you need to evolve the know-how in terms of whatever big change you're looking to do. 
Um, what about the social and individual aspects? How is the existing culture and the individuals going to react to large changes? Does it fit with their worldview? Does it fit with their personal agendas? Does it fit with the cultural values uh, that you're introducing a big change? All right, so the idea here is no improvement revolutions, make changes evolutionary. And so this means that doesn't mean that the changes have to be extremely small, but they need to be done in stages over time. The idea here is that you want to give your culture and the people within it a chance to keep up with the pace of the change. You want your know-how to be improving at the same rate. So what is your capability to improve your know-how? How can that change over time? And so your, your improvement targets need to be kind of staged out, kind of evolutionary, we're gonna change it a little bit, see how that works, try to get it to stick, and then move on to the next set of improvements. You get to eliminate resistance, you'll get more buy-in, and also you may learn a lot in the process. So part of changing over time is you gain a lot of knowledge through that change. And perhaps it may change even your goals um, and make your goals a little bit fitter, more congruent. And so this idea of giving yourself the chance to catch up to the change and really make it as lined and aligned with the ability of your organization. And organizations that, that do this tend to have their changes stick. They tend to find new interesting goals along the way and generally find themselves much more competitive in their environment. All right, so there you have it. Three things you can start changing right now. And I know these are big challenges and easier said than done, but keep in mind that evolutionary change thing of the last point where you can start to make some adjustments to how you affect leadership and management in your organization. You can go to our website at swirlnorth.com where we got lots of articles on these topics as well as uh, quite a few other things. If you need maybe more direct support, just send us an email and let's chat about your particular challenge. In part two of this video, we're going to talk about the next three practices that you should consider changing and they're good ones. So we'll see you in a bit.